Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world once more with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. For me, Saudi Arabia is the heart of darkness. I've been there, of course. I've even had good relations with the former king, Abdullah. But its ever more sinister role in Iraq and Syria, in Yemen and Lebanon, and its secret and steadily deepening relationship with Netanyahu all serve whatever anyone thinks of it to keep the Saudis at the heart of all the big stories. Saudi Arabia is the British state's best friend and a very good customer too. But all is not well. Most of the 9-11 hijackers were Saudis and the US Congress is closing in on Saudi assets for what would be the biggest compensation deal in history. The collapse in oil prices, driven by the Saudis themselves to harm Iran, Russia and Venezuela, has created crises for the Saudis themselves. It may or may not be a related fact that the regime is cutting off people's heads like there was no tomorrow. And for the royals, there might not be. Making sense of it for the Sputnik is master analyst and writer David Hurst, editor of Middle East Eye. David, let's start, if we may, with the most explosive of all revelations. I put that quotation mark in because it is denied by the Saudis, and we don't yet know the truth of it. But the Panama leaks seem to indicate that Saudi royal money, $50 million of it, was given to Benjamin Netanyahu for his election campaign in the last Israeli elections. If true, I can't think of anything more devastating to the uh, reputation of Saudi Arabia in the Muslim world. Is it true? I don't know. Uh, but it is uh, a, a really big claim, and it has to be investigated. It wouldn't surprise me if it were true, because we've been writing stories, I've been writing stories for quite some time about the deepening relationship between the Saudis and the Israelis. And the trouble with the Israelis, of course, they boast of it. Um, and they say we've got the best relations with the Arab, meaning the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, than they've had uh, ever before. Uh, and that's what they mean, and it's a security relationship. It's all under the table, it's all done. Uh, there's, a, there's a plane fueled up to go on Ben Gurion Airport every day, either to Cairo or via Jordan uh, to, to the Emirates. And, and there's a constant security traffic, there's a, it's intelligence traffic as well. Now, these aren't strong foundations because it doesn't involve it's not a people-to-people -people relationship it's a government-to-government -government relationship but i'm absolutely certain it's there now of course uh, political crises uh, are only uh, one side of it having themselves proactively driven down oil prices to uh, very low levels below 30 dollars a barrel uh, the Saudis are now themselves feeling the pinch, asking for loans, imagine, on the international market, cutting subsidies, raising taxes. And just this week, uh, they, uh, or the week before, they sacked their oil minister. What is the current state of the Saudi economy? They have got a fiscal buffer, which will last them about five years. It's big. Um, however, what everyone is concerned about is the rate of depletion. And basically, they shed, the, they, they had a budget deficit. Uh, they were, they, 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 their reserves fell by about 100 billion uh, last year. If that keeps on going, they've got five years left. Uh, and what are they going to do about it? Well, they've got this grand plan. Um, and the sacking that you mentioned, it actually took place on Saturday, was one part of 51 royal decrees, all um, initially in the name of uh, the father, uh, 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 Salman, but actually written by the son, the 30-year-old son. He's more or less running the show now, isn't he? He is running the show. Um, and there's quite a lot of concern in Saudi Arabia and outside of how much power is, is actually accrued in his plant. He's only the deputy 
uh, crown prince. There is a crown. There is a crown prince, and we're not hearing any. Uh, but he's hmm? someone else's son. He's someone else's son. <laughs> Bin Naif, he's vastly more experienced. Uh, initially, when Salman took over from Abdullah, uh, the country was divided into sort of two fiefdoms, basically. It was uh, Bin Salman, the favoured younger son of Salman, who would have the economic, basically, portfolio, and Bin Naif, who would have the security, Bin Naif, uh, the security portfolio. Now, all we hear, the only person who talks about war and peace, and who talks talks about the war in Yemen, uh, the, the only person who talks about this grand vision they've got, Vision 2030, is this 30-year-old son. And a lot of people are asking questions. Hang on a moment. Uh, that's a lot for a 30-year-old just to take on. Just wondering how this um, <clears throat> burst in the oil crisis, pr prices, have affected the people in Saudi itself. Is it already coming to their senses, or are they still living They're feeling in the bubble? pain? They are feeling the pain, and, and one of the problems is that the whole point of trying to reduce the budget deficit is an old-fashioned privatization and austerity campaign. Um, and we know what happens to austerity here in Britain and in Europe, and we know the trouble it causes. Imagine the trouble an austerity campaign would cause with such huge uh, differences in wealth and 30% of, uh, of, of youth being unemployed, the Saudi youth. That's the real time bomb. In, it's the demographic time bomb in Saudi Arabia. And these huge disparities as well. So one of the things that Bin Salman's trying to do is cut the water subsidy, which is a big thing. Um, and people are complaining about it all over. There's a really interesting incident that happened to the Bin Laden uh, construction group, which was sort of the builder of choice for the al Saud family. For years and years and years, it was the biggest construction company in the world. Uh, a crane fell on the old mosque in, uh, in Mecca, yeah. um, killing 100 uh, people, more than 100 during the, people. The last Hajj. During the last Hajj, yes. Um, and there was a huge political row about it. All the executives of the Bin Laden group were stopped from going abroad. And Bin, La and Bin Salman, looked at the accounts, and he went through all the accounts, and he found um, $1 trillion worth of projects that didn't have a contract to them. And he immediately froze the whole lot. The result is that there was suddenly a huge debt. They couldn't basically pay their wages for, for 50,000 workers. They stopped paying the wages. Not only did they stop paying the wages, uh, they actually told them all to leave the country. So what the workers did, they burnt the buses outside the, uh, uh, outside the headquarters. There's a big fuss. There's stories in the media, stories in, our, in the Middle East Eye and, 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 and everywhere else about it. And now uh, they've promised to pay about 10,000 of them. But this is the typical sort of, of the biggest construction company, not just in Saudi Arabia, but in the world. This is a typical boom-to-bust story. No, the regime has... Uh has an extant, uh, you might say, structural problem with the Shiite minority in the eastern province in the country. They appear to be able to handle that just by force of numbers, force of arms. But if discontent were to spread amongst the others, amongst the Sunni bedrock of the regime, that would be curtains for them. And uh, there might be a jet powering up in Riyadh headed for, uh, for Tel Aviv rather than the other way around. Um, how likely is that? Is there a big enough split in the royal family itself to see some kind of putsch, some kind of coup as one possible response to this? Well, I think you've got to choose your words carefully here because there could certainly be ructions. I don't think there's yet enough material for uh, a coup, as, you would, uh, as you'd put it. But it's also got to be said that when Salman took over from Abdullah, there was a sort of palace coup. He chucked out all of the advisers. Mm. Now, that could happen again. Mm. Um, and certainly, um, uh, Bin Naif's position uh, uh, could be under threat. And certainly, there are uh, big internal ructions within the royal family itself. Now, what you're talking about is some sort of insurrection uh, a popular insurrection, a sort of Arab Spring mm. in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And um, uh, I think they're worried about it. And I think there's certainly the material there in, in terms of youth unemployment and a country that is, is, is really living on borrowed time as far as uh, um, a democratic uh, uh, uprising is concerned. But uh, who's to say when it's going to mm. happen? Now, in the past, the regime could have counted on the bottomless support of the United States 
there are signs that that is changing, uh, particularly if Trump were to become the president, ironically. Uh, but the Congress now is moving to hold Saudi Arabia liable for the enormous loss of people and property. I mean, it would be the biggest uh, compensation payout in history. As, uh, as Gayatri said in the introduction, the uh, likelihood of that passing and not being vetoed and so on, we could argue about. But it's a sign, isn't it, that the United States is losing patience with the Saudi regime. Yeah, I think something fundamental has happened with the United States, and I don't just think it's about Obama. I think it will affect the next president as well. There is a weariness about the Middle East entirely caused by their own interventions, of course. Uh, no one's innocent in this. And there is a complete paucity of intellectual ideas or policy. What is Middle East policy? It's setting arms. They're setting arms like no one's business. They're killing people like no one's business in their drone uh, program. These are not peaceniks. Yeah. Uh, but what's the policy? And if you look at it from the sort of um, receiving end of this, the client end of this, uh, the Saudis say Abdullah said to himself, well, if uh, Obama's a pre prepared to let uh, Mubarak go, he might be prepared to let me go. And so, th so, so what's happened actually is the sort of uh, the American security franchise as such has, 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 has gone, has, has been inherited by the Saudis, and they're making their own policy. That's one of the causes of instability in the region, is that, in fact, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, uh, Qatar, uh, all of these regional players are now making their own policy. Uh, and sometimes it is mutually contradictory. So the, the, the guys who are fighting uh, in, in Yemen are not the same guys that they're fighting in, in everyone switches sides all the time. Egypt. Uh, has given uh, lip service to uh, the military campaign of the Saudi and the Emirati military campaign in uh, uh, in Yemen, but it hasn't actually provided any troops. So, er so you, you can see this complete chaos, and this one intervention hides another. That that's what's so worrying about it. And I'm not saying we should go back to sort of a, you know American or British colonial hegemony, um, but. Uh, this is a much more unstable Middle East. And the Americans don't have many ideas left. No. Well, you and I have specialised in that region for very many years. And uh, I suspect even we would find uh, a difficult uh, road out of all this because, as half an Irishman, I could say I wouldn't have started from here <laughs> if I was looking to get out of it. David Hurst, thanks for joining us on the Sputnik. Coming up next, Gordon Brown moments for David Cameron and the Queen. Don't miss it. Back to Sputnik. It was embarrassing enough when David Cameron was caught on tape describing Afghanistan and Nigeria as fantastically corrupt, even if it did have the benefit of being the truth. But it was not the whole truth. The Afghan regime was put into power by us and billions in corruptly obtained looted Nigerian wealth is sheltering happily in London. Even more embarrassing was the Queen herself, captured as her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, usually is, on tape, being rude to Johnny Foreigner. Now that was news. Her target was China, the most populous, most powerful, biggest economy in the world. So who else should walk us through here? but China and Africa expert Keith Bennett. Keith, let's start with Africa briefly, if we may. Nigeria is and has been always fantastically corrupt, but A, most of the corrupt looted wealth is here in London, and B, Nigeria finally has a president who's cracking down on corruption. It was a pretty crude, vulgar, thing for Cameron to say, wasn't it? I would think so, yes. Uh, when you're putting forward a flagship anti-corruption conference as one of your major international initiatives, it's probably not a very good idea to insult two heads of state when you've only managed to attract four of them to come in the first place. Uh, Nigeria <laughs> is... Of that. So half of the heads of state coming to the conference were insulted in one quip by exactly. David Cameron. Uh, with Nigeria, of course, for, for decades we know that sections of the Nigerian elite have been uh, bleeding billions and billions out, out of the country. Accord, uh, two years ago the economic figures were, were recalculated and it was discovered that Nigeria, not South Africa, is 
Africa's largest economy. And of course, it's a country that sits, literally sits on oil. And yet uh, people queue in, in Lagos or the capital Abuja for hours and hours to, to fill, fill their cars with petrol. So the fact that there's huge corruption in, in Nigeria is not an issue. But President Buhari, the current head of state, uh, first of all, he was elected on an anti-corruption platform. Secondly, this is his second term as uh, head of state. He, he was a military ruler at one time in the past. And, and at that time, he was noted for you know, what would be said to be a very enthusiastic, very draconian uh, anti-corruption crackdown. So it's not just words. The, the man has a track record of, of, of fighting corruption. And it, it really seems uh, gratuitous to, to insult him. And of course, this money that's bled out of Nigeria, it's not held in Nigerian banks. It's not put through the Nigerian financial system. As you say, it's, where is it? It's in the United States, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and these various uh, crown territories and dependencies, what we used to call uh, colonies. And President Buhari said that when that corrupt money is um, located, it is, in his words, very tedious, costly, and time-consuming to get it back. And he's proposing an international anti-corruption architecture that when looted funds are identified, they should be returned immediately and in full. And I think Mr. Cameron would be better advised getting behind President Buhari's efforts rather Indeed. than insulting him. Now, uh, Mr. Cameron has once or twice in his life uh, apparently been caught behaving injudiciously in front of cameras. But the Queen, uh, I, as far as I know, never has. Uh, the revelation this week that she was insulting China and the Chinese leadership, her guests recently in Buckingham Palace, came as a genuine surprise to me. Uh, probably means that she's doing it all the time, but it's never <laughs> captured on camera, but it came as a surprise. I'm used to the Duke of Edinburgh with all his racist uh, jokes and epithets and so on. Um, she said they were rude. Um, it's never been my experience that Chinese people are uh, rude. What did she mean by that? Well, perhaps I'm not the person to ask <laughs> what she meant. Um, You're the nearest <laughs> to Her Majesty that we could entice on to the show. Right, OK. Uh, but I think it has to be set in, in, in some kind of context, and, and I'm sure that the, um, that the Chinese are will do so. First of all, I think that... When you have a state visit by, from any country, the security and protocol people from that country, you can expect to be pretty much focused on the convenience, the needs, uh, the respect, and, and the security of, of the person that they're working for. I, I don't think that that's uh, yeah. terribly unusual. Um, so I can imagine there, there will be kind of tense moments in, in any of these kinds of discussions. But I think more broadly... It's, you have to look at this in, in the context of history, that uh, in China they talk about 100 years of, of shame and humiliation when China was a, a plaything of, of the, um, the imperialist powers. And the first president of China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, talked about China's foreign policy being to unite in solidarity and to unite in common struggle with all countries that treat us as equals. And I think this question of treating as equals uh, is, uh, is, very, is very important uh, for the Chinese. And, and if you put that Chinese sensitivity mm. about the need to be treated as equals against some of the rather archaic rituals that the British establishment still surrounds itself with, uh, you might recall that uh, Michelle Obama was excoriated in sections of the press because she dared to put her arm around the Queen in the gesture of affection. You might recall that an Australian <laughs> Labour Prime Minister, I think it was Paul Keating, was told off because he dared to touch Her Majesty on the arm. So I guess the when you're used to that level of deference, yeah. the concept of rudeness might come across slightly differently than it may to you or I, who <laughs> live in a more rough and tumble world. I believe it was reported that the comments from the Queen were censored in China. I don't know to what extent that's true, but I do believe that there was a uh, throwback uh, that the Chinese actually responded to, to the Queen in their own ways. I think the Chinese are would be keen not to give too much publicity to, the, to this comment uh, in, in China for, for several reasons. One, 
as I said, they don't want this kind of incident to unduly interfere with what they hope to get out of the bilateral relationship. And what people sometimes fail to realize is that the Chinese government has to be very sensitive to, to public opinion. And the public opinion in China is much more sensitive on questions of, of, of foreign slights and insults or the behavior of countries with which China has some historical grievance than the Chinese government and the mm. Chinese authorities are themselves. So you recall that uh, Dong Xiaoping uh, gently chided the Queen's son, Prince Charles, over the Hong Kong when Charles ventured some advice to China as to how things should be after the return of Hong Kong to the motherland. Dong Xiaoping said the days when China took orders from foreigners uh, is long gone. And this squares with the point, the overarching point that you are uh, making. Let me, if I may, switch gear. Uh, the Panama leaks, of course, have been enormously embarrassing, damaging to all kinds of people, all kinds of countries, except the United States to date. Uh, but I have to tell you, as a friend of China myself, they don't make pleasant reading vis-a-vis uh, -vis China either. There appear to be a significant number of people with close family relations to former leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. Is this some kind of blip? Or does it mean that China's own commitment to cracking down on corruption and so on uh, is not quite what it seems? Well, I think that uh, nobody denies that, that corruption has become a serious problem in China and has been uh, for, for a long time. And the, the successive leaders of the Chinese Communist Party for over and, and the Chinese government for well over 20 years have actually said that this is a life and death issue for them. Uh, what's been different about the present regime is that it has been, uh, it th is that there, there has been not only a lot of talk, but, but a, great, a great deal of action. Literally dozens, if not hundreds, of ministry-level officials in China have, have been toppled and, and punished for, for, for corruption. Some executed, even. Yes, yeah, some people have been executed for corruption. Uh, not anybody with a political background so far. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that uh, this problem, which one has been accumulating over a couple of decades, and two is quite deeply rooted in, in the sort of traditional feudal culture anyway, is going to go away um, o overnight. So as you uh, review uh, the situation in China now with the economic uh, wobble, which was, of course, inevitable given the world international situation. You optimistic for China uh, going forward? Yes, I'm fairly optimistic. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't, there aren't problems. Uh, the point is, of course, that there have always been problems. Uh, people in the West uh, seem to think that only they are capable of identifying problems in China, and if there is a problem, it's incapable of solution. Mm. Actually, the Chinese are probably more ruthless and self-critical about their problems than foreigners are, and they're determined to, to solve them. Uh, just last week, The Economist had a 16-page supplement on, saying, on China's banking and finance, saying that a huge uh, bust uh, was inevitable. And I think this would be worrying if it wasn't for the fact that The Economist published a similar report back in 2002, which said that China's leaders had run out of time and options, and the next uh, and the next decade, China would enter into a period of grave economic instability. In fact, over that next decade, of course, the Chinese economy grew uh, by more than any other economy in history. Well, that's a very positive and optimistic note to end on, Keith Bennett. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? 
Well, uh, about Saudi Arabia um, and their relation with us, basically, Raymond Deloney says the medieval Saudi state has been the architect of its own downfall. The unforced oil price cuts has backfired massively. Well, you know, there's a great Chinese saying that sometimes the enemy struggles mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on its own feet. <laughs> Very apt. AK says, because we need a reason to help them with bombs, missiles and troops. And in response to the Queen's comments about China, Ellen Swanson says, it's understandable she found them rude. I mean, she lives with the world's most polite men, Phil the Greek. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. But that, alas, means it's the end of my first show back. But you can stay in touch with us through the social media on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.